Hello, friends and family. Welcome to uh, Good Tree Christian Fellowship YouTube channel. Thank you for signing in today and to join us in our time of worship together. As we begin, let me just read from Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 to 29. The Apostle Paul says this, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. And so this is a reminder that as we come together in this time, that we are working together with all the energies of Christ. And so please know that the staff here at Good Tree, we are continuing to do our very best to serve all of you. So I would just ask that you would keep us in your prayers as we work and labor for you and for God and his glory. As we continue, let me just give you some quick announcements. First, from the community team, they like to present the first official online, online <laughs> potluck dinner. All Good Tree members will be divided into teams and will share in an online potluck dinner. And so the way it's gonna happen is basically the leadership team will personally reach out to everyone in Good Tree community and they're kind of, they're assigned a certain group and everyone will make a dish and then they will all share that together. And so if you don't hear from anybody from the next couple of week or so, uh, please contact us through info at goodtree.ca and let us know so we can put you or assign you to a group. As we gather and we do this, share this time of potluck together, it's just kind of something to kind of break the norm a little bit for all of us and to connect in fellowship, get to know each other just a little bit better. And so, and there are going to be prizes available. Also, on February 14th will be our annual general meeting around 345. So please make time for that for those who are members at Good Tree. And then starting next week, February 7th, we will be offering a limited in-person service for those who need it. We will follow the, all the AHS uh, kind of rules and regulations with 15% of the sanctuary capacity. Uh, but when the government kind of opens up the rules a little bit more, at that point in time, we will go into the kind of 25% of the sanctuary capacity, and then we will offer children's ministry at that time as well. And so uh, those are your announcements for this week. Please bow your heads with me in prayer for the call to worship. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Lord, as we continue now in this time of worship and we seek you, Lord God, and we seek your kingdom and your righteousness first, continue to move in our families, in our homes, in our communities, and remind us, Lord God, that you are at work and that it is you that so powerfully works in and through all of us. So continue to renew our strength and our minds for your service. We can now look to you, Lord God, in our time of worship. And may all praise and honor be given unto you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Yes, Lord, you are the name above all names. God, you are worthy. Worthy of our praise. you open our hearts, Lord, to you, to your words, and we ask that you speak now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hello, Good Fruit. Welcome to a corner we're going to call What's Growing, Good Fruit? And Good Fruit Ministry is our children's ministry here at church, and we thought it'd be great to update you guys, our church family, on what we've been learning throughout the month. So you can look forward to seeing our updates at the end of each month. And so I, I encourage you guys to pray for our children and um, grow together as we learn about uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Take a look at what we learned in January. Please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. The Christian writer Parker Palmer tells a story of a longtime farmer who took a job working for the Department of Agriculture. This man really loved the land, and as a longtime farmer, he was motivated to make sure that public policy ensured good soil management. But one day, his boss ordered him to sign a policy that would make some fast money, but would damage topsoil. And this guy was stressed out. What should he do? Should he obey his boss for money, or should he listen to his values? He couldn't sleep at night. He tossed, he turned, he prayed for help. And in the morning, he got up and his mind was clear. He went to work and he did something risky. He walked into his boss's office, and he said that he would not sign the policy. When he was asked later how he could take such a risk, here's what he said. I woke up in the morning hearing my farmer's heart tell me that I do not report to my boss. I report to the land. That is God's call on my life. What is God's call on your life? Who do you report to at the end and at the beginning of every day? And how are you willing to risk for who and what you love? 
We're studying the Lord's Prayer, and we've come today to the line that is actually right at the center of the Lord's Prayer. It is, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Jesus actually connected that phrase to the one before it, your kingdom come. So we saw last week that the kingdom of God is not just a faraway place that we go to after we die. It's also a reality that God is bringing to earth. And he's bringing it to earth through what Jesus did and through Jesus and his followers, through you and I today. The kingdom of God has been described as God's dream for the world. And so your will be done on earth as in heaven is when God's dream and our lives connect. So you and I can actually advance the kingdom of God by how we live, the decisions we make. But doing this... To live a life reporting to God will sometimes take risk. Doing God's will is a little bit like playing sports. It can be compared to uh, an individual sport or maybe a team sport like hockey or football or basketball. Sometimes in a team sport you have to play defense, but sometimes you have to go on offense. Playing defense spiritually means at times saying no to what we know is not right. Like that farmer who said no to making a quick buck in a way that would damage the land. He knew that wasn't right. So doing God's will on earth sometimes means defending what we believe and not giving in to the things that are wrong. But it also means, at times, going on the offense. Now, what I don't mean by that is being offensive or doing things in bad taste. What it means is taking God's love and truth out into the world when it's risky, engaging culture, seeing the possibilities, creating opportunities to love people, and then just going for it. Jesus is our prime example of doing this. We know what Jesus said. He said God so loved the world that he did what? He came into the world. Into the world in person in Jesus. Our world is a beautiful place, but it's also a broken place. It's a chaotic place. It's unpredictable. It's dirty. But that's what God did in Jesus. God didn't just sit in heaven and defend his holiness. He came in person. You know, we're the only world faith, major world faith, that believes this. Buddhists believe that this human, Buddha, achieved nirvana and that in each person is a, a Buddha nature. Hindus believe in human avatars that channel the divine. Muslims believe in the prophets who speak for God. But only our faith believes that God incarnated fully in a human being. It was Jesus. And he did it out of love. And it was risky. Jesus was criticized. Jesus was condemned. He was crucified. But then the Father raised him from the dead. The Father said yes to Jesus and to the kingdom. The kingdom is now established. It is a certainty. It is unstoppable. The kingdom is coming. God didn't stop there. Then God came in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to help us, his followers, be like Jesus in the world. We can take risks like the Savior did. Jesus, in fact, said we will sometimes do greater things than he did. We do it because greater is he who is in us, the Spirit of God, than he who is in the world. God is with us. 
So we can do it. We can love. We can risk God's love. You know, my experience as a pastor for almost 40 years now is that the majority of Christians are risk averse. Most churches are risk averse. We love to play it safe. We like to be comfortable. We're afraid maybe to look foolish or to fail or to be ashamed. So you know what we do? We play defense. We, we spend lots of time doing churchy activities. Churches are built for defense, not for offense. I got to confess, I'm that way. As a pastor, I was trained really well to play defense. I can make a lot of excuses for playing defense. But the older I get, the more I want to take my faith out into the world. I don't want to hide in church because Jesus didn't hide. He came to serve on earth. He risked because of love. Your will be done on earth as in heaven will require risk. And I think it's something that our church, Good Tree, and maybe if you're listening, you're part of another church, all churches need to be talking about how we do this wisely in our world in a place like Canada, a postmodern, some say post-Christian world in 2021 and beyond. How does this happen? How do we do it? How do we risk? Well, we have so many ways of being God's kingdom people. But we see in the Gospels that so often Jesus did it by loving the stranger, the outsider, the person who was right in front of him. We're going to end our message today by hearing an example of what this actually looks like. It's a clip from a few years ago now when a Christian named Tony Campolo, who's a true risk-taking Christian, did something, to me, outrageous. Tony Campolo, if you don't know, was a sociologist and a pastor from Philadelphia. He had flown to Hawaii to do some work. And while there, in the middle of the night, a stranger walked into his life. And what Tony Campolo did is like a case study for us. It can illustrate the kind of love, creativity, and riskiness that can motivate you and I today. So let's listen to his story, and then I'll close us in prayer. You go to Honolulu, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning if you're from the East Coast because of the time difference, and I, I was hungry. I went looking for something to eat up a side street. I found a greasy spoon. I went in. There were no booths, just a row of stools in front of the counter. I sat down. There was nobody in the place. I, I didn't touch the menu. It was one of those plastic menus, you know, and grease had piled up on it. And I knew that if I opened the thing, something extraterrestrial would have crawled out. <laughs> this fat guy with a greasy apron, unshaved, cigar comes out, puts the cigar down and says, what do you want? I said, a cup of coffee and a donut. He poured the coffee and then he did this. <laughs> and he picked up the donut. <laughs> I hate that. So I'm sitting there, 3.30 in the morning, munching on my dirty donut, <laughs> went into this place, come about 10 or 11 prostitutes. And they sat on either side of me. And it was a small place. And I tried to disappear. The one next to me was especially boisterous, and she said to her friend, tomorrow's my birthday, I'm going to be, I'm going to be 39. And her friend said, so what do you want me to do? Sing happy birthday? So you're going to be 39. You want a cake? You want a party? First woman said, look, I don't want anything. I'm just telling you it's my birthday. Why do you have to hurt my feelings? And then she added, I've never had a birthday party in my whole life. I don't expect to have one now. That did it. I waited until they left. And then I called to Harry over. I said, 
Do they come in here every night? He said, yeah. I said, the one right next to me. He said, Agnes. I said, it's her birthday tomorrow, Harry. What do you say we decorate this place? And when she comes in tomorrow night, we have a little party for her. She's never had a party in her whole life. He grabbed my hand and squeezed it and said, Mr. That's beautiful. Beautiful. She ain't come out here. This guy wants to throw a birthday party for Agnes. It's her birthday tomorrow. She came out and she said, oh, Mr. That's brilliant. Nobody ever does anything for Agnes, and she's one of the, the good people in this town. I know, I know what she does to make money, but she's a good person. I said, can I decorate the place? She said, to your heart's content. I said, I'm going to bring a big birthday cake. Harry said, oh, no, the cake's my thing. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I got there the next morning at about 2.30. I bought this crepe paper at, uh, at uh, the Kmart. I strung it across the place. I made a big sign, happy birthday, Agnes. Put it on the mirror behind the counter. I had the place spruced. It was ready. Jan, who did the cooking, had gotten the word out on the street. By 3.15, every single prostitute in Honolulu was squeezed into this diner. It was wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes. And me! 3.30 in the morning, the door opens. In comes Agnes and her friends. I've got everybody set, everybody ready. As they come to the door, we yell, Happy birthday, Agnes! And start cheering like mad. I've never seen anybody so stunned in my life. Her knees buckled. They studied her. They got her down on a stool and we started singing, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. And they brought out the cake with the candles. That was it. She lost it and started to cry. Harry just stood there with the cake, with all the candles. I said, knock it off. Come on, Magnus, knock it off and blow out the candles. Come on, blow out the candles. She tried, but she couldn't do it, so he blew out the candles. <laughs> he gave her the knife and said, now cut the cake. Come on now, cut the cake, Agnes, cut the cake. She sat for a long moment, and then she turned to me, and she said, Mr., I really don't want to cut the cake. Is it okay if I don't cut the cake? I said, it's your cake. It's your cake. You can do with it what you want. She said, I want to take it home. I want to show it to my mother. Is that okay? I said, sure. She stood up. I said, do you have to do it now? She said, I live two doors down. Let me take the cake to her. And, and I promise I'll bring it right back. I promise. She picked up the cake like it was the Holy Grail. And she pushed her way through the crowd and out the door. And as the door swung slowly shut, there was dead silence. You talk about an awkward silence. All of us were just standing there, stunned. I didn't know what to say, so... I finally said, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you say we pray? <laughs> it's weird looking back on it now. A sociologist leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a diner at 3.30 in the morning. It was the right thing to do. And I prayed that God would deliver her from what filthy men had done to her, probably starting when she was... She was too young to even know what was going on. That's how these things start, you know. Some kid, 11, 12 years old, gets messed over by some filthy slob and, and her self-image is destroyed and she's ruined and we blame her when we ought to be blaming him. And I prayed that God would make her new because we're here to declare the good news that no matter where you've been or what you've done, Jesus can make you new. When I finished the prayer, Harry leaned across the counter and said, Hey, Campolo, you told us you were a sociologist. You're a preacher. What kind of church you preach in? And in one of those moments, when you come up with just the right words, I said, I, I, I preach in a church that throws birthday parties for 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> I'll never forget his response. Never. He said, no, you don't. No, you don't. He said, I would join a church like that. <laughs> wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all love to belong to a church that threw birthday parties at 3.30 in the morning? I got news for you. 
I got news for you. That is the kind of church that Jesus came to create. I don't know where we got this other one that's half country club. I'm sure that Pastor John and I are going to be discussing this at our midweek conversation on Wednesday, so we hope that you can join us. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we want to do your will on earth as in heaven. So inspire us, we pray. Inspire us by your spirit. Forgive our false fears. Forgive our excuses. Fill us with love for the stranger, for our neighbor. Give us the courage to risk. We want to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, Pastor John, thank you for your message today. What a challenging message. How do we become risk takers in such a risk adverse society? And so I mean, we're definitely going to unpack this uh, together in the midweek reflections. But as we conclude our worship and our time together, please bow your heads with me for the benediction. Let us pray. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to his gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings and has been, named, been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the ob obedience of faith. To the only wise God be the glory now and forevermore through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for joining us today and go in peace.